So, so Federico, thank you for for attending and for giving a talk. And uh, so we will begin a bit a bit earlier, but uh, I think okay. So let's go. Uh, let's go. Okay, perfect. So thanks to all to be here. I'm Federico Mandano and I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Chirurgy under the project ECOTEP. Today, I would like to present you a joint work carried out along uh, Professor Tommaso Proietti from the University of Rome for Bergata, where we propose basically some uh, econometric tools uh, uh, to be applied in the context of uh, climate change. On the light that, uh, of the new discipline that is uh, uh, raising in these years, that is called uh, climate econometrics. In particular, today, we will analyze and study in this article uh, the problem of uh, detecting uh, time trends in uh, atmospheric data. Well, first, uh, we have to point out that uh, understanding hetan dynamics is of, of crucial importance in the context of climate, uh, of climate change. This is because hetan, which is a hydrocarbon, affected the distribution of ozone in the troposphere and the formation of ground level of ozone as pollution effects on the high quality and the major ecosystem. On the, other, on the other hand, ethan is an indirect greenhouse gas, which affects the atmospheric lifetime of methane, such that ethan emission can be used as a measure of uh, methane emissions. And since methane is uh, released in the atmosphere by both natural events and anthropogenic activity, uh, while ethan emission do not have any significant natural sources, we have that by monitoring ethan levels, um, we have the occasion of a measure in a, in a much more accurate way the human contribution to the abundance of uh, methane in the atmosphere. And methane is one of the main uh, direct greenhouse gases. So, according with the main uh, literature, we have that uh, ethane emission in the northern hemisphere may be mostly attributed to the production and the transport of oil and natural gas. According to the estimates in the paper of uh, Helming at 2016, we have that uh, biomagic and biomass burning uh, emission accounts for about 22% of global ethane emissions against the remaining 78%, which is attributed to anthropogenic activity. An increasing on ethane trends has been found in the troposphere during the period from 2009 to 2014, with a peak in 2015. And uh, we have this trend after a reversal. Uh, um, with a reversal after some decades of uh, depleting of the ethan uh, abundance in the atmosphere due to the regulation policy versus the main anthropogenic emitters that appear during the 19 and the first years of the 2000. Then we find uh, we found the Yakus in the ethan route, which is detected in 2015 and 2018, uh, was nature maybe only temporary according uh, always to Helbig, and still needed to be fully understood. So in this paper, we analyze uh, HR measurement, which basically are ground-based Fourier transform infrared solar spectral measurement of ethan abundance in the atmosphere that are recorded in uh, 15 ground, ground stations all uh, around the world. We have basically uh, 11 ground stations in the Northern Hemisphere and just uh, uh, four ground stations in the Southern Hemisphere. Here in this slide, I show you the time series that are the main object of our, of our analysis. So you can easily see that uh, each time series is uh, characterized by a strong seasonal behavior. And this is basically the annual cycle of the hetan because hetan degrades faster uh, with the high temperatures so during the summer and degrades less faster in, um, and, it, in the, and is released uh, during the winter time. This is because of the chemical reaction that we have in the troposphere, in the troposphere between uh, mm, the hetan and uh, the so-called uh, OH radicals. Uh, another, um, Another thing that we can observe from this series is that we have a large amount of missing observation. In some cases, we have up to 95% of missing data for the time series, uh, and a minimum of 50% of, uh, of missing data for only one time series. So basically, um, here we plot also the long periodogram for this series, 
and you can easily observe that uh, the periodogram are able to detect the fundamental frequency of, uh, of the Hetan cycle at the Hanol frequency. And also we see some persistence to the first harmonics of this cycle. So finally, we have that the high persistency of the Hanol cycle and the elevation amount of missing data makes the, the, the detection by visual uh, expectation of uh, time trends under this, uh, behind this series a very difficult task. As you can observe, we, we cannot uh, find by visual inspection a trend behind this, uh, this data. And so the, 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 the detection of these hidden components is the main objective of our, of our analysis. Uh, so, previous studies in the literature in order to study the problem of uh, to detect the head and trends in, in, uh, in, in, for this data, share the main approach in, the, in treating the head and cycle as deterministic and uh, proceeded to remove it by regressing uh, the data on a, sum of, on a sum of sinusoidal terms. Then the analysis were then carried out on the residuals of uh, such regression by splitting the sample into time period and fitting a linear trend for each subsamples in order to detect a change in the trend direction. Uh, a recent paper of Frederick et al. 2020 point out that uh, this linear approach may obscure important characteristics in the data. So they propose a nonlinear and non-parametric model where the estimation of a nonlinear trend allows to capture much more interesting features from the series. For our point of view, there is no reason to treat the ethan cycle as deterministic. Since uh, ethan depends on annual temperatures, it, it is known that uh, the, the phase and the amplitudes of global temperature are varying over years. Therefore, we propose and we suggest to model the, um, the cycle as, uh, as stochastically. Both the, the trend and the cycle, so in our approach, are modeled via a stochastic process, so no deterministic. In our, in our particular case, the cycle result from the sum of M non-stationary fractional sinusoidal waveform process. It is a kind of process that has been introduced recently in the literature by me and uh, Professor Proietti in a paper of uh, Journal of Econometrics. And basically, uh, via the tool, these tools, we have that each of these uh, process determine the persistence of the cycle at each one of these M harmonics. Our models also allow for the possibility of a deterministic cycle as a limited case, such that the real nature of the cycle can be suggested by the inference on the model parameters. Finally, uh, the trend component in our approach is modeled as a so-called type two fractional integrated process, which I refer to the work of Marinus and Robinson and Chinan Chinai, which drive the, the process at the long run frequency. Estimation is then carried out by quasi-maximum likelihood and the signal extraction is carried out by the Kalman filter and the associated spotting algorithm. Missing values are treated by the Kalman filter, skipping the updating operation. Uh, one time uh, an observation is found to be missing. We believe that this model and the associated learning methods are a vital contribution to the literature on the evaluation of Asian trends and in particular, our analysis confirms the presence of a common trend in both the northern and southern hemisphere, uh, with an increasing during the period 2009-2014, uh, following by a successive hiatus in 2015-2015, after which it is seen to reverse its direction. So let's introduce our methodology. So we start by defining uh, um, the fractional parameter T, which be belongs to the interval uh, 0, 01. And we define the standard difference operator delta. This is, this is equal to one minus L, where L is the standard lag of operator such that LK times XT is equal to XT minus K. And then we define the fractional noise process, AT equal to delta to the power of minus D times eta T, where eta T is a 99D random variable. We can have the following non-Markovian representation of the, um, of the process AT, where the coefficient uh, psi j evolve, evolves according to equation one. So basically the parameter, the fractional parameter T measure in some way the persistency of the process, or if you want the memory of the, of the process, such that if D belongs to zero one alpha, then the process is a long memory under stationarity and the autovariant function exists. In the case D belongs to one alpha and one, then the process is non-stationary and the autocovariance functions do not exist, does not exist. 
we want uh, in particular to study, to study this case where we have uh, non-stationarity. For this, in our assumption, D belongs to the interval zero one. And so uh, both the stationary and non-stationary scenario are uh, hollowed. Um, well, we can, uh, um, we can uh, uh, construct the so-called type two fractional noise process just by uh, truncating these infinite sums at the index t minus one, such that the type two fractional noise process is defined by equation two. In this case, notice that we can add a constant term to the um, to our main equation that is a zero, such that the a zero basically represents the represent the rest of the infinite sum. So it basically is our initial state of, uh, of this process. At the end, the, the model is uh, speci speci specified in, uh, in equation three, where basically xt represent our atom time series. A0t is the trend component. that is a type two fractional noise process. And uh, psi, psi t is the, is the cycle, which is given by the sum of m psi gt component. Each psi gt component is a non-stationary fractional sinusoidal wave form process, uh, which evolves according with the equation four. Basically, if you see a, a equation four, you see that uh, psi gt basically is a stochastic uh, sinusoidal wave, and the parameters that regulate the phase and the amplitude of this wave evolves according to two independent uh, fractional sinusoidal to, to, to two independent uh, fractional noise process. Basically, so the fractional noise process, this long memory process under non stationarity is the main ingredient of uh, our model. And uh, basically, it's uh, able to capture the persistency in the data at each one of the frequency, both the frequency of the cycle, so the harmonics of the cycle, both the zero frequency that give our trend. Basically, the assumption of our, of our model are uh, completed by assuming that uh, all the disturbances, epsilon t, eta, eta zero t, et, and eta jt, and eta jt star are mutually uh, uncorrelated. Well, estimation of the model parameters is carried out by maximizing an approximation of the true Gaussian likelihood because we cannot uh, um, maximize, maximize directly the true likelihood because both for the presence of a large amount of missing data and both and, and also because the inversion of the uh, of the covalence, covalence matrix may be very intensive when we are close to the non-stationary case also may be impossible our model can be represented in a state space form and the likelihood can be evaluated via the support of the Kalman filter um, because as i said before the, the the main ingredient of our model that is the fraction noise the non-markovian process then we will have a state space representation that is infinite, such that we have to find a Markovian approximation of uh, our fractional noise process. This, uh, uh, sorry, like with the red one, ah, like this. On the mouse, okay. Click on the I click on the screen. I don't know, make a... okay. It's what perfect. Merci. Okay, so as a Markovian representation of, uh, of each fractional noise component, we follow the approach proposed by the recent paper of Hartle and uh, Eukedis 2022, who consider an arbitrary approximation of the long memory processing. Basically, so to, ob um, to obtain the coefficient of, uh, of the autoregressive and moving average representation of equation five, we minimize the mean square approximation error in uh, equation six, where the coefficient of psi j are the one that uh, we see before in equation one. And uh, on the other hand, the coefficient of psi j theta depends on the Harma coefficient via the following convolution between these three polynomials. Okay. Uh, well, at the end, we obtain the following state space representation of the process that is given in equation eight, where we have the um, observational equation and the measurement equation. Here we have this uh, term delta that is a vector of constant uh, represent basically the initial stage of each fractional noise component, which are the eight zero uh, constant that we see before. 
the, the, the state vector is given by alpha t and it has dimension p plus one times 2m plus one. Uh, 2m plus one is the total number of fraction noise process that we have in our model, and p is the choice of the Markovian approximation. Uh, the value of the of the other matrices are given here in equation nine and in equation ten. I know that it will be a little difficult to understand uh, immediately by visual inspection, but basically, for who is familiar with the Kalman filter literature, we are just using an Arma Pura presentation given by the, the book of uh, Harvey and GDHT5 about uh, forecasting with uh, state space uh, models. And uh, then we use this representation and uh, we put for we put it for each uh, for each uh, process for each fractional noise process just by put together by by constructing block diagonal matrix using the chronicle product here. So uh, it will be easy after um, a bit of computation to obtain from this representation our main model in equation three. It's just uh, uh, algebra. Uh, so, maximum likelihood estimation of the model parameters is performed with, with, the, with, uh, with the support of the augmented Kalman filter. And the parameter vector delta, that is, as I said before, represents the initial state of each fractional noise process, is concentrated outside of the likelihood. So, at the end, what we, we will maximize is a profile likelihood, which is maximized with respect to the parameters vector in uh, the parameters contained in the vector, uh, in the vector theta. The good uh, advantage of using uh, this karma filter approach is that emission value can be handled very easily via, uh, via the augmented Kalman filter just by skipping the updating operation. Uh, through the Kalman filter, we can also we can uh, um, so extract the various components of our model that are so the, um, the component in the state vector, where each AJT is basically one of the fractional noise. So if we have a zero T, we are extracting the trend. The trend. If we have a one T, we are extracting the fundamental cycle, and so on for all the successive harmonics. Um, so let's now present our main analysis when the um, when the structural model in equation three four is fitted to the edge of time series. One of the main issue concerning the specification of uh, our model is the selection of the end harmonics. So which harmonics of the cycle we have to select? If you will look to the periodograms here in the non standard periodogram of the etan time series, basically this is just the um, inverse Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function of the sample autocorrelation function of, of our data. So how many harmonics we can say that we have here is not easy to know. For instance, the, the, the long scalable periodogram here uh, indicates like nine harmonics, but maybe it could be that some harmonics can hide some other in this representation. Is always a biased representation of the uh, true persistence of the process. So we adopt the following uh, um, uh, recursive procedure. Basically, we, we estimate uh, uh, until to 10 models. Uh, starting from uh, M, number of harmonics equal to J plus one for J equals zero, one, two, uh, since to nine. And we start by uh, estimating just the fundamental harmonics at, at, uh, at, the, beginning, at the beginning, that is a lambda one. And then we proceed by adding at each step another harmonic. If, uh, the, if by adding another harmonic, we obtain an increasing of the maximizer the likelihood, then we, we keep this harmonic in the analysis. Otherwise, we proceed forward and we discard it. Um, for, uh, for what uh, concerns the Markovian approximation of the long memory processes, we set phi is equal to three. So we will use an arma free free approximation of uh, each uh, fractional noise process. And this approximation has been found very powerful by Hartle and the uh, Eugenist 2022 in approximating the long memory of a fractional noise process. So let's see uh, uh, the result of our analysis now. So basically, these are the, um, the parameter estimates. I don't know if you are able to see this number, maybe, maybe not, but uh, I, I just uh, shortly say you what they means. Basically, what we find and, and is that the memory parameter that measures the persistency of the thread, so at the zero frequency, is found to be non-stationary. So for all the series, basically we have a non-stationary component that drive the trend of the Ethan series. 
On the other hand, concerning the cyclical component that concerns so the frequency that goes to one and so on, then we find that first we do not find in many cases um, significance about harmonics after the fifth harmonics. Just in the case of the Bremen and the Rikubitsu series, we have a significance after the fifth harmonic. In a, uh, on the other hand, we also find an estimates of the memory parameters that are basically almost all uh, under the threshold of 0 0.5. This means that this suggests us that how our uh, series, our each and series are driven by a stationary stochastic cycle. And this is one of the main conclusion. Let's see some uh, residual diagnostic. Here I put the periodogram of our, of our residuals um, for each series. And you can observe that uh, uh, no residual periodicity can be found in our uh, in our residuals. I also show you the sample output relation of the residual. And you see that in almost all cases, the residual appears to be very weak correlated. This means that our model provides a good fit on the HMCS. We just find some correlation of the first line for the La Reunion and the, and the also Bonis series. Then here, I also show you the cuckoo plot of the residual. So in a we are not very uh, uh, far from a normal distribution for the residual. Of course, you can complain that we have, uh, in some cases, a strong form of, the, of asymmetry and of leptocorticity. This is because probably, probably our model is not able to capture perfectly the, um, the heteroscedasticity that we have in the HL series. Finally, I also show you here the extraction of the cyclical component. This is uh, one of the main results that, uh, that we have uh, um, new with respect to the uh, previous literature. What we found here is that the cyclical component is raw, so it's not uh, smooth like previous studies uh, claim. And so it's not a deterministic component. And finally, we have the main output of this, uh, of this paper, that is the extraction of the hedge trends. So one first comment and uh, is that if we observe the, the, the trend in the Northern Hemisphere, we found a common peak around 2003. This, this we can find in the series Rikubetsu, uh, Halesund, uh, Kiruna, uh, Zakspice, and Tule, for instance. This uh, peak in 2003 is, can be probably explained by the big fire in uh, Siberia that uh, take a place during 2003 and uh, it is the maybe the largest fire in the recent history um, so the, the the large release of, of uh, biomass uh, burning emission uh, created this peak in the head and seniors. another um, common behavior that, that we can found in this trend is this uh, growing dynamic between 2008 and 2014, with a such a peak in 2015. You see that this dynamics is common for the Bremen, Eureka, uh, St. Petersburg, and almost all the North Hemisphere trend. Okay, how we explain this dynamics? Well, this uh, dynamic is not uh, very new because it has been cited by previous analysis and uh, in and basically, it was attributed to the oil and natural gas production in the United States. If we look to the um, monthly United States natural gas production and uh, crude oil production, uh, we see that this is time series makes the same dynamics. So we have a growth between 2009 since 2014 with a peak in 2015. And then we have also another peak in 2020. Probably this is related to the COVID crisis that dropped the production. Uh, if you put together all the northern and southern hemisphere trend in this uh, uh, daily average, so we see that the red line that is the northern trend is able to capture the 2003 peak, that is the peak related to the boreal forest fire, along with the trend growth in the, between 2009 and 2014 and the peak in 2015, related to the production in, uh, of oil and, um, and uh, natural gas in the United States. Another thing that we can observe here is that if we concentrate the southern hemisphere, that is the blue line, the blue, the, the, the blue line here, we see that we have a similar behavior. So this trend is increasing uh, along with the northern hemisphere trend, but with a sort of July. 
This probably suggests that the dynamics of ethane in the northern hemisphere are probably affecting also the uh, southern hemisphere uh, via um, inter hemisphere transport, which is one of the main uh, um, source of, uh, of the of the ethane abundance in the southern hemisphere. Well, um, so for what uh, concerns also the southern hemisphere, if uh, we see how our initial map, if you remember how our ground station in the south hemisphere was more concentrated in the in the um, around the, the Australia region. So basically, the, the the various peaks that we found in this uh, in this southern hemisphere trend, uh, maybe that are more than the one that we find in the in the north, uh, can be more, mostly attributed to the uh, uh, bash fire season that we have in Australia each year. For instance, if you look to the trend of the Wollongong series that is located um, in the state of Victoria State, I think we see a little peak in 2020, which is probably attributed to the uh, last bash fire season that maybe you, you heard about it to the television. And the peak uh, around the 2007 in the louder series is, uh, could be probably attributed to the grid divide the fire that is the um, largest fire in the in the in the story of the Victoria state so so let's just uh, draw some conclusion so um, with this uh, paper we try to provide a good tool to investigate on the trend dynamics on H and time series notice that in our model the linearity assumption is preserved and this allows for an easier implementation of, uh, of the analysis with respect to other approach available in the literature. For instance, I refer to the nonlinear methodology proposed by Frederick in 2020 without any drawback in terms of accuracy of the results. We saw that our model is able to capture much hidden characteristic from the, from, from the data. Finally, how our uh, analysis also suggests that the HNCS may be driven by a stationary and uh, stochastic annual cycle. And this is a result is something of new in the literature because since now the annual, annual, annual ethan cycle was treated as deterministic. Finally, we found a common pattern in, the, in both the northern and southern hemisphere, um, which seems that these ethan trends seem mostly, uh, seem mostly driven by the exploitation of oil and natural gas in the United States. And what is happening in the United States, it seems, it probably suggested that of, uh, from this, the analysis that it is affecting the dynamics on ethan all around the world. This was basically all, so thank you for your attention. <laughs> So um, I know that methane have a long life in the atmosphere. Methane. Methane. We. Yeah. Uh, what about methane? I mean, two two months. Okay, so it's not an. Impact. No. It doesn't have much like impact on your. No, in fact, for, for this we call it in indirect greenhouse gas. As you okay. see, the, um, the methane ha has a, a, a long lifetime, so it's a direct uh, greenhouse gas like CO two. But methane is uh, just too much because it uh, uh, disappears from the atmosphere because of chemical reactions. But it is important uh, because uh, by, as I said before, by measuring ethane, we can understand more about methane. Okay, this is uh, one of the points. Have you measured this or tried to, to measure this, uh, this, this relationship between ethane and methane? The relationship between yes, Have well, you tried to understand that using your model? Uh, you mean to, to look for some correlation between ethan and not via this model, but I read pretty lot of literature where this uh, this um, this topic is uh, is um, is taken in account, and we and all the authors find the uh, high correlation between ethan and ethan. This is because they are emitted are co-emitted in the anthropogenic activities, in particular in the extraction of natural gas and in, 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 in the transport of natural gas. So that's a pleasure to, to, to hear about the work of Anton Kimovsky, who is in a, in a group uh, of a very nice interest, very closely related to 
to this uh, Ecode project, and I was very happy to, to discover and to, to, to be able to, to invite you. So thank you, and uh, I let you I let you speak. I just put full screen. And so, okay. yeah. so thank, thank, thanks a lot for the invitation. I was indeed uh, very pleased to know that there is a, um, I think it's freshly established network that you are having this is a small or project. This is a project that just for some uh, few years. Okay, so it's, it's already going. Years. Okay, okay. So, um, so indeed, uh, well, I will, I will, I will tell a bit at the end of, 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 of my talk uh, about our network, and uh, but it's having a very small network of uh, ten scientists. But let, let, let's dive in into the topic. So, um, so we are trying to, to model uh, evolving networks. Uh, I mean, we were, we are not. Um, so our original motivation was not specifically uh, given by uh, ecology, but uh, there, there, it might be of use. So um, a probabilist, but uh, also these topics are actually are were interestingly motivated by uh, statistics and by statisticians. So I will mention some of them. Um, uh, so. So, the, so there is this need uh, to study large networks, complex networks, and um, one needs also to do estimation, for example. Uh, one has to have some parameters to estimate. And uh, so actually statisticians were actually excited to have uh, some limiting objects for large networks. Um, and apparently they're being estimated. So let me just... Uh, introduce this probabilistic uh, limiting objects of um, large networks. So we're sort of letting the size of our network tend to infinity and we would like to sort of describe the, this limiting object. Okay, so let's start with finite graphs. And um, so let's, um, so I hope this is readable, but um, so this calligraphic GN uh, denotes the set of all uh, labeled simple graphs on n words. So these are finite graphs, so all possible. And we would like to, um, I mean, there is a standard sort of encoding of these objects via adjacency matrices. So these are just matrices with entries zero and one, depending on whether there is an edge in the graph or not. And our question that we are uh, so far would like to address is how to describe or partial address because there is, as you will see, there is no definite uh, definitive answer. So there are partial answers for specific classes of graphs. How to describe the n large limits and of these objects and the limiting objects. So one way uh, which leads to this limiting objects called graphons is uh, to embed this adjacency matrix into a set of uh, bivariate functions on uh, unit squares or Linear space part two. So we are looking at uh, functions on the unit square 0, 1 times 0, 1, uh, mapping it to, to the interval 0, 1. Um, we assume that they are symmetric, so this, uh, we, are, we don't care about uh, the uh, sort of direction of the edge, so we're looking at the symmetric graphs, but I mean, this is not a, uh, this is not a uh, sort of essential constraint. But how do we encode the finite graph in terms of such a function here? So we just um, basically split up our, so let me just do it by example. So let's consider this graph with six vertices, for example. And uh, so what we do is we sort of consider equipartition of our unit intervals over here uh, into, and then this induces the partition of, of the units square into this of little squares, so the sticks for, for, for this specific graph. And then we just uh, mark them, let's say, in, in black if, if there is a corresponding edge between the respective vertices. Okay, so there are this kind of uh, checkerboard pictures or black and white pictures uh, that we are looking at on, on this interval 0, 1 times 0, 1. So this is the embedding. And uh, now the question is, so how can we describe the energy of, it, of these objects? So to do this, we need to introduce, uh, or one introduces, uh, one can introduce several 
distances or actually a lot of distances and other notions of uh, convergence, but many of these natural ones uh, actually coincide. So one of these is the cut distance. So the, this is just the distance between such two functions. This is the supremum over two sets, subsets S and T. And so we are basically measuring the absolute value well, the absolute values written outside of the integral. So it's just the integral of the difference between these two bivariate functions. So, um, and we take the supremum over uh, all such subsets. So um, it is natural to work actually with unlabeled graphs, but in terms of this bivariate functions, this unlabeled graphs corresponds to following sort of uh, equivalence in terms of measure preserving bijections between the intervals. So let's consider, let's let uh, sigma to be the set of all measure preserving bijections of the interval 0, 1 into itself. And let's declare two such bivariate functions equivalent if, if they basically uh, are uh, up, sort of the same up to this bivariate uh, sort of isomorphism, meaning that we sort of apply the same uh, bivariate uh, sort of uh, transformation to both coordinates of the function. I mean, naturally, so sort of this bijections correspond to a sort of uh, forgetting the labels, sort of all possible permutations of, of, the, of the labels of, of our graphs. Okay, so, so instead of looking at uh, the space of uh, all such bivariate functions W, we just can look at the space W tilde, which basically the space of equivalence classes. This is basically the operation of unlabeling. Okay, so um, and then we have to sort of uh, again have a notion of distance between two such uh, sort of candidates for limiting objects, and this is just the infimum of uh, all possible this square distances. Okay, so this is uh, the distance on the equivalence classes is called the Okay, so I mean this is this is a well-known theory, and actually we would like to. So our aim is to let this object actually also evolve in a stochastic way. But before going to evolution, let me just briefly go through the uh, basics of the theory for static objects. Okay, so next, so in order to sort of define the convergence, um, one way is to look at the subgraph count. So basically what we do is we consider a finite graph F, finite factor that what you might be interested in, let's say an edge or a square or a triangle. So I mean, we would like to see how often does this pattern occur in our graph. Okay. So, and we just measure the density. Basically we just measure the number of occurrences of this finite pattern in a large graph G and divide by the total number, uh, by the maximal number of possible basically, uh, occurrences. And uh, we say that this, uh, sort of we denote this density of subgraphs, or subgraph counts by T, and we say that uh, a sequence of labeled simple graphs, GN, on N vertices, so it's like a growing sequence of graphs, converges, I mean, so far it's, it's, it's all deterministic here. If this uh, subgraph densities converge as real sequences, as n tends to infinity. Okay, but now the question is converges to what? And well, obviously that it will converge as, as you might sort of anticipate it will converge to a graph form. So how does it happen? So um, consider a finite graph F uh, let's say on k vertices, and consider this bivariate function h from w, and then we define uh, by an abuse of notation. We define the density of a subgraph in sort of this graph form, just by computing basically this here, this object here, and if you think carefully about it then basically what we do is we, we just sample k, so we just subsample k vertices in sort of our, well, h is not a graph, but in our sort of candidate for the limiting object. And then we just uh, look at the sort of probability that there are edges 
in this sort of subsample corresponding to the edges in our pattern. Okay. <laughs> so we just compute the probability that under sort of uniform subsampling from H, we see uh, the subgraph F. Okay, so that's the meaning of this subgraph density in, in this bivariate function. Okay, but then this is actually not quite an abuse of notation because we can actually use our embedding. So given the graph G, we can sort of embed it into H and then our notations will basically agree because if one sort of inserts instead of H, this for, for a given finite graph G, sort of if we uh, insert its embedding into this bivariate function to this formula, then we actually recover indeed the uh, homeomorphism density or the density, subgraph density. Okay, so both of these notations you need. And then, uh, so in, the, in this sense, we can declare that GN converges to H to a bivariate function, but sort of limiting object when uh, this sort of finite subgraph counts converge to this subgraph count in the limiting density H okay, for all finite and simple graphs. So in, 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 in this sense, we sort of declare this H as a limit of the this embeddings of the finite graphs. Okay, so, um, but it turns out that, that, uh, that there is a problem, slight problem, or a big problem if you want, but this theory works actually for all sequences. But the problem is that of graphs, but the, the problem is that this theory is only informative for dense graphs, meaning that if you are looking at graphs with degrees of order n, okay, because for uh, sparse graphs where the degrees, let's say, are bounded with, in the size of the network, then this graph on sort of this limiting bivariate density will be just zero, so we will typically not see any. Uh, uh, pattern that you're looking at. So this is just not informative. And so this is one challenge in this area to sort of devise a theory for uh, sparse networks. Okay, but let, let's, uh, so how I'm actually doing on time. So when, when did I start? Okay, so um, I mean, there is another, View so, so so far it was pretty deterministic. Okay, so so the theory was pretty deterministic, but um, one can view this theory actually as through the lens of the sampling convergence, and sampling inherently introduces sort of randomness into the model. So alternatively, we can view this sort of subgraph densities as um, probabilities. I mean, we did it actually here. Right, so we sampled something and computed. This is sort of an expectation here. Okay, so we can say that GN converges to H uh, or to some uh, limiting object, let's say, not necessarily H, if all random substructures, and we should be sort of more specific about how do we construct this random substructures, but this is also a benefit of this whole approach that we can sort of introduce different ways to sample actually from our finite object if they converge in distribution okay so by introducing obviously we need some topology on uh, uh well, at least on this on the samples or whatever whatever we call as samples but in order to define the convergence in distribution but in the, in the worst case we can just use discrete topology sort of so I mean, this is this is a very, also very well known method to construct limiting objects in probability theory. It was advertised by Aldous and uh, many others. So the idea is that so we we are if you would like to define a convergence of some finite but asymptotically big structure to something and to introduce a limiting object, we can play with sort of ways to subsample from it finite structures. And then uh, these, these objects are now random. And then we can just say that, uh, or check if they converge to something in law, at least, in the n-large limit. And then 
this might suggest sort of way to define these limiting objects. And in fact, sort of we did it right now on, on, the, on the previous slides. So, um, and that's uh, that's basically the sort of recitation of what we did, but now in probabilistic terms. So if you look at a sequence of graphs, let's say on n vertices with some edge sets, and then we sample some, let's say, k vertices out of this n, uniformly at random for simplicity and one can play with the sampling uh, and we introduce the natural sort of induced subgraph spent by these vertices and sort of we say that this gn sampling converges if the subsamples now as random graphs converge in distribution okay. and uh, turns out that this is actually exactly what we did uh, on, the, on the previous slides. And note that uh, sort of there is another good thing about well, at least this specific sort of subsampling method is that these subsamples are exchangeable in this sort of matrix way. So if you exchange walls and columns using the same sort of relabeling, then in distribution, our subsample will stay the same. Okay, so this is um, an exchangeable object. People in statistics like it very much also, and this is also. This was also motivation probably for uh, statisticians like uh, Crane also to look at uh, these objects and Corrader. So it's sort of the, um, so the, here is a short summary of uh, of results. So it's just uh, not not exhaustive. So the, the, there are some, there's actually a body of literature on this graph ones and also on the statistics side on their estimation. So basically, uh, let me just state that. All these statements here are equivalent. So GN converges sort of this uh, embeddings is a Cauchy sequence in this metric that we introduced in this box metric. Sort of these subgraph densities converge um, as real sequences, or the statement that there is a double sort of the, the, the limiting sort of graph on and the densities of finite graphs converge to the density of a pattern in the bivariate function or gn is a sampling convergence so all these statements are equivalent well it's some metrics or some matrices are better than the others and but uh, well, at least sort of it's nice that uh, this box metric is turns this space of graph ons into a complex bit so, but now, as, as I said, so our actual aim is to let this graphs evolve. So we would like to consider dynamics of random graphs, sort of GN, depending on T, and we also would like to consider the N large limits. So one way to do this is, again, to look at graph ons and as stochastic processes in some way okay. um, uh, but again so that there, there are many possibilities to do this and one should be careful about sort of topologies in, in this sort of uh, space of, of limiting objects so so far key challenges uh, these are current challenges to my best knowledge sort of construct examples with rich enough limiting stochastic dynamics sort of and this would be uh, natural candidates to do statistics schemes for example to estimate the sort of parameter system, to estimate the, the dynamic graph on maybe. Um, okay, so that's the second point, but also uh, the challenge is to construct a good theory for sparse networks because these graph ons are not informative. Okay, so um, and the motivations are so basically you name an area, and so there if basically all complex systems you look at have a network of interactions behind them. And most of the networks are actually not stationary, non-constant in time. So they do evolve over time. So social networks, think of friendships or about the recent pandemic where all our interactions were sort of uh, cut uh, or most of the interactions were cut. So economic networks, but also in particular biological networks. And let's think about environment, environmental changes, um, just evolutionary forces, also population genetics, all this induces sort of 
evolving structures, evolving sort of entities or forces which are which act on biological systems. Okay. So um, let me just uh, cite uh, some previous work and describe some of them which I was involved in and what, what we are currently doing. So just to be sure, how much time do I have? Okay. So, um, okay. so sort of there is a lot of models of dynamical graphs for finite m. Okay, so it's sort of, uh, I mean, just to specify your whatever part of chain, uh, your transition probabilities, but the challenge is to construct rich enough limiting objects because you quickly, it seems, end up in some trivialities like deterministic dynamics in the limit because there's a lot of averaging things place. In particular, if you look at this subgraph counts, so these are in some sense averages, um, and therefore, for one has to be careful. And one attempt was to construct sort of a more broader theory by a statistician, Harry Crane, uh, in a series of papers. So he has also a book actually on uh, sort of limiting objects for networks, which also has a part on evolving networks. So he constructed limiting dynamics based on uh, this exchangeability, sort of, um, which is in turn sort of this subsampling. Uh, so for him, the, his limiting object was not the this frequencies, but actually this exchangeable, in a sense, infinite incidence matrices. But the, the, these objects are related. So what? So, but this exchangeable incidence matrix and some, in some sense more informative than just this density. Okay. And then he used uh, the Aldous Hoover theory of exchangeable arrays in order to sort of. Uh, identify the basically parameters in these models, and these are high dimensional parameters like graph lines. Okay, so these are sort of directing functions, directing measures, whatever you call them, like, like the graph on like this bivariate function. Okay, uh, together with Yuji Cherny, we extended a bit this theory because Harry Crane was working just with instance zero so one value matrices, we extended this theory to weighted graphs. So, uh, without going into much technical details. So let me just informally state our assumption. So we assume that the network is a weighted graph, so not just incidence metrics, but maybe the weights, like the intensity of communication or interactions, for example. Uh, this is also important if you would like to think about processes happening on networks, because typically it's not just about uh, if you have a connection, but how often you have a connection and uh, something like this. So it's, it's more informative to, be, to have weighted graphs. So these natural elites also to vertex exchangeable arrays, but now not zero one, but in general weighted. And uh, so we assumed also that our the dynamic of this infinite object of the limiting objects is Markovian. And we handled both discrete and continuous time sort of situations. And it turns out that um, in some sense, these assumptions are relatively restricted for, for the limiting dynamics, even though one has to be careful about cho choosing the, the, as I said, the topology in this, on this infinite object. Okay, so basically, uh, I mean, it's, it's for example, the, there are such pathologies as if you assume that the infinite object, sort of the limiting graph is Markovian, then some samples of Markovian uh, graphs, which you observe in your basic when you do statistics, might not be exchangeable, but might not be Markovian, sorry, because they might sort of depend on something happening in, in infinity or somewhere else. I mean, this is sort of a clear, more or less plausible statement, uh, which is less plausible or, or less expected probably up front is that, uh, so, and this, this is also related to the to topology. So, so if, we look at uh, failure market processes then in continuous time, then actually this failure property induces that uh, also subsamples uh, are Markovian. Okay. And then also the uh, what can happen at uh, with the, this Markovian process at jump times is also uh, pretty restrictive. So either 
macroscopic event can happen, sort of a positive, like a very global catastrophe, a positive fraction of edge weights in the array, in the, in the array will sort of change in a giant way. Or a mesoscopic event, so sort of just um, like all vertices incident to a vertex, in a sense, will change their status. Or just a single edge will, will, will jump. And also Crane sort of noticed that in, in one natural topology, it seems like it only jumps are possible and no uh, diffusions are possible. But again, he was looking at exchangeable arrays and not at the uh, subdial densities. And um, another group of people recently have uh, used subgraph density. So they were just looking at subgraph densities and they managed to sort of show that there are some natural and actually a rich class of dynamics, stochastic dynamics for these subgraph densities. Uh, including the diffusive dynamics. Okay, so their idea was to use basically models from population genetics in the following way. So they introduced types of nodes. So each node has a type. In the simplest situation, just two types, but one can introduce infinitely many types. And so they used population genetics dynamics to let these types evolve, but then sort of, I mean, it's just types evolving. So what about our network? So the net to, to introduce evolution of the network, so they did the following. So they connected the individuals by edges with probabilities depending on their types. I mean, in, in, the, in the simplest situation, in this example, so we just take MRN model. So probably uh, yesterday, I had to skip the day because I was teaching, but uh, I'm sure yesterday there were some presentations sort of uh, referring to population genetics models. So if you consider n individuals, so what's a MRI model? So if you consider n individuals carrying one of the types, so it's in this sort of simple situation, it's just two types, zero and one. At rate one, an individual draws and he's sort of, in a sense, parent individual, and including he can by chance also sample itself and just copies the type of a parent. So it's just he just assumes the type of a randomly chosen individual. In population genetics, people think about it as uh, at a birth event in a, in a sort of a colony of individuals of a fixed size. So, and then we just keep track of just the number of individuals of a given type, let's say zero. And then we rescale uh, and sort of rescale the time and in a sense, scale, just look at the density of this individuals of type zero. And then it's, it's known that this stochastic process, this Markov chain here, XN, converges to a diffusion process driven by uh, the Brownian motion and with two sort of absorbing, obviously, so there are two fixed points, basically, all individuals are having type one or all individuals are having type zero, therefore there are two sort of fixed points here in this volatility term. Okay, so this is right Fisher diffusion. And this will be the driving sort of force of our uh, network. So we do the following. So we sort of construct a network GN on N vertices where we connect two vertices. If the vertices I and J for, for simplicity have the same type. So with probability one, they are connected if they have the same type. But one can also play with uh, a lot of things here, including introducing additional sort of randomness, such that, for example, the probability to be connected if they have the same time type depends on their, in some sort, in some sense, fitness or on the fitness of the type. So this must not be that simple. And then we sort of uh, see that if we compute this density of finite subgraphs in this GN, and this GN actually depends on T because our population of types evolves over time. Then an easy calculation shows that uh, it basically converges to this limiting diffusion, diffusion process, the right Fisher process, Y to the power K plus one minus Y to the power K. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that our limiting graph on looks very sort of, it is very simple sort of, um, the individuals of the same type are uh, 
connected. So that this probability one, so this corresponds to this sort of uh, dark square here and here, and the individuals of different types are not connected, but sort of the sizes of these two um, blocks are sort of wiggling in a, in a diffusive way. So this Y of S was a diffusion, which was basically uh, wiggling here between zero and one, and at some point sort of just uh, absorbs in one of the uh, states. But sort of this is a picture of a limiting infinite object um, uh, with sort of a diffusive behavior. Okay, so this is, uh, and one can introduce, one can play with the sort of connection probabilities. One can, instead of looking at two types, one can look at multiple types and so on and so forth. This is sort of a, a big uh, sort of uh, zoo, or a little big zoo of models was already uh, introduced in this paper. So, but let me just conclude with uh, what we are basically, what with the further outstanding challenges, what we are doing now. So we would like to actually, so what, what the, uh, the authors didn't do, they haven't written down the, actually the gener generator of the limiting objects. And somehow it also relates to the fact that they are in some sense cheating here a little bit, that they're just looking at the densities, at the projections of the real infinite objects and not of the object itself. And well, the outstanding challenge about sparse networks also in the dynamic situations, even more so it's a challenge. Furthermore, it is important because networks is not everything. So typically like infection processes, spread of pathogens uh, happen on evolving networks, thinking again about the uh, ongoing pandemics. So one should look also at stochastic processes on evolving networks. And uh, well, the, the, the last bit, I haven't been working on that one, but I'm very interested. And so uh, if you are uh, working on uh, something related, so I would be very much happy to invite you to one of the workshops of our little network. So it's a network on stochastic processes on evolving networks. So it's a network of 10 researchers. Uh, most of them are located in Germany, but um, we have also participants from members from England and Norway. Um, so, if you are working on something related, we would be very much happy to have you maybe even give a mini course on one, one of the workshops for that. So, let me stop here and thank you for your attention. Well, in the usual way, I mean, you just, I mean, there is a mutation and selection. Uh, that's actually an interesting uh, uh, thing to do because it will help you sort of, um, I mean, you, to have a richer, for example, equilibria. And this is, uh, I mean, this is just usual way. You just can take uh, the sort of, let's say, you can just say that the type one changes with some probability so apart from just for this copying dynamics. So that, for example, there is like a, or in continuous time, you would say that uh, at some rate, you just uh, change your type according to some kernel to another type, for example, this is an introduction of, of mutation. So for selection, I mean, you can also introduce even fitness landscapes here, and you can sort of uh, say that uh, certain individuals are preferred according to, to, to be sort of sampled from, I mean, or you sort of, typically get the types from fitter individuals so they reproduce in a more uh, sort of uh, uh, successful way. Um, so all, basically you can just take any uh, population genetics model and this will induce a network model in a sense. Just because, because you mentioned that they were not able to uh, describe the dynamics of the limiting objects. Uh, well, in some sense, in some sense, they managed because the, the, it depends on what you're looking at. So they, yeah. they actually sort of said, so the, basically they provided the formulae for all this subgraph density. So if you give a graph, then you can sort of say with which sort of density it will occur in your dynamical model. And this is, for example, the, this, this, this 
probability. Yeah, but you fix this S, this time S, right? You fix time S and then you look up to that time or something like this. Uh, no, I mean, it, it's all stochastic. It's, an, in, it's even in, uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of an, in distribution in the sense of processes. So it, it, it converges even in a pass-wise oh. sense. I mean, sure, it, it, it is a it's stochastic process. It's measurable with respect to filtration up to current time. So all you have to know in order to sort of go forward um, I mean, it's a diffusion, it's a Markovian process in particular, so, so, yeah. So, when you talk about the, the, uh, the assumption that the, the graphs have to be dense, mm -hmm. and the initial challenge of dealing with the sparsity, yeah. and the, I have two questions. One is that, um, most of the biological networks we know are very sparse. And, and what would that mean in terms of what is what brings you to you what brings to your mind to actually uh, uh, realize that? Uh, and, and the other thing is how dense you know have to be. Is there a track transition when you move a, across a, a sparsity to no, no, there's whole zoos in between. Okay. That's that's also one but there's no kind of a universality class at the time. Uh I mean that would be it would be very interesting to have that one, but uh so one can think of sort of also renormalization in ideas, and we actually did this for uh population genetics models in our in, in another so not in the network context. So we actually used ideas of renormalization group to study actually multi-scale phenomena. Um so this can also be probably done here, but it is, well, I mean, yeah, all, all, this is all with a caveat that uh, this hasn't been done yet properly, but also I still think uh, there's even more sort of uh, uh, freedom available also. So for example, the, the, there are other objects that I haven't talked here about that are a bit sparser than graph ones. These are called also graph X's. So, but, but basically, uh, this graphics is arise for a bit sparser graphs where you sort of, in order to see something still in the limit, not just the zero density that you don't see anything, you actually do some, for example, like site percolation. So you just uh, change your sampling procedure. So you can also play with sampling procedures and you will get other a bit richer objects, but it's still not really sparse where you are, uh, you have just in expectation that's finite number of individuals but for these situations and that probably also comes to your first part the first part of the question uh, so one can use things like local weak convergence um sort of and use the facts that typically these networks if they are sparse they're also trees so that you can try to find like approximate this networks by trees uh, locally in this sense so you can say that locally what you are looking at is a, is a tree, and then you can uh, start from there. Would you arrange for a, a set of, an example of such a graph would be, uh, if I take the average mean, the mm -hmm. graph with B equals to C divided by N, this would be something like this, or? Uh, uh, yeah, so, so this, this graph, is, yeah, exactly. So this graph is a sparse graph in, in uh, sort of on average, you have like C neighbors. And uh, so the graph on limit of this graph is just zero density because you won't see any basic bias. But uh, you can use this local weak convergence method. You can say that uh, if you look at the distances of logarithmic order in this, in this graph, then what you see is basically a tree. So you don't see any loops. And then you can say, yeah, yeah, exactly. So then you locally sort of converge to both lots of tree, for example. That, that's, situations and it, it, it works uh, on that but so the, the idea is to try to for instance to take this example as a by uh, example to build a theory which could uh, yes the idea is to, uh, to to sort of to, to build theory for for this dynamic limiting objects but uh again so i don't think there is like a unifying big theory for all this so, so there is a whole zoo of sparseness uh, but uh, this is a very relevant question, whether there are some universal objects. And, and I think this is a multi-scale issue. So, so one has to take into account that there are 
sort of structures appearing on multiple scales, you have to take any scales. Thank you. I, I will stop the.